Hello to all physics enthusiasts and fans of physical experiments. This is Alexei Kolchin, and our today's video is dedicated to the Kapitza pendulum. And to start this pendulum, we built this, I won't hesitate to call it vibrator, here. The electric motor drives a crank slider mechanism, and the piston moves with a swing of four centimeters. That is, the amplitude of the oscillations is two centimeters. An inverted pendulum is fixed at the top of the piston. I turn on the motor and gradually increase the voltage. The pendulum begins to rise from its tilted position and finally stands up and is held vertically. And of course, we need to explain this amazing phenomenon. But first, I must say that such an inverted pendulum was invented by Pyotr Leonidovich Kapitza in 1951 while working on a high-frequency, high-power generator to demonstrate the principles of this generator using a simple mechanical model. The deviation force manga acts on the pendulum at small angle approximations. What opposes it? When the piston passes the lowest point, it pushes the pendulum up with the force T2. And when, when the piston passes the highest point, it pulls the pendulum down with the force T1, and these M forces form a certain angle between them. So the resultant force T can be estimated as the magnitude of force T1 multiplied by this angle V. Well, we can estimate force T1 as the mass of the load multiplied by the amplitude acceleration O2A. Then the restoring force T will have this form. And the conditions of equilibrium can be written like this. This is our restoring force, and this is the deviating force. And now we need to use geometric considerations. This red side of the triangle is equal to 2A multiplied by alpha on one side, and on the other side from this triangle, R, multiplied by beta, where R is the length of the pendulum. We substitute this relationship into this equation. The masses and angles cancel out, and we get this formula. Omega squared. A squared should be on the order of g multiplied by r. And omega a is nothing other than the amplitude velocity of oscillatory motion. So we obtain the condition of equilibrium v squared on the order of gr. And I must emphasize once again that what we obtained is, of course, a rough estimate. Because t is the average over the period of the pulling and pushing forces acting at different times. And this formula V2 on the order of GR shows us that the amplitude velocity of oscillatory motion must be sufficiently large for the pendulum to stand vertically. Alexei received the grades, and I would like to focus on a more precise theory now. But, first, it makes sense to abandon this noisy machine and switch to computer modeling. And my modeling will be based on transitioning to the reference frame of the moving piston, where the acceleration of freefall g is added to the variable acceleration ao squared, times the cosine of omega t in this model, there is no energy loss. However, if the amplitude of the piston oscillations is not large enough, the pendulum cannot remain in the inverted position and falls. But if the amplitude of the oscillations is increased by just 15%, the mode of movement changes. And now the pendulum performs slow oscillations, superimposed with fast jerks at the frequency of the piston's movement. And this means firstly that we observe the threshold amplitude velocity which Alexei has already mentioned. And secondly, that the movements of the pendulum in such modes are divided into fast and slow. And now, we will bring this division of fast and slow movements to life. Let's write down Newton's second law for the inverted pendulum. We will simplify both sides by mass m and divide by the length of the suspension r. Note that g divided by r is nothing other than the square of the angular frequency of oscillations of a simple pendulum of length r. And this frequency omega large is much less than the frequency of oscillations of the suspension omega shaft. Let the ratio of the piston 
amplitude A to the length of the suspension R be denoted by the letter A, and this value is much less than 1. As a result, the equation of motion of the pendulum takes the following form. Now we will solve this equation, and we will look for the solution according to the results of computer modeling in the form of the product of two factors, slow, cosine, gamma t, and fast. So there we have this fine rattling, 1 minus k cosine, omega small t, where k is much less than 1. Well, now we need to differentiate alpha with respect to time twice, and I will not write out all the terms in this second derivative completely, but I will write out only the main ones. One is slow, and one is fast. The slow one, the main one, is in parentheses. We need to leave only the unit, differentiate cosine gamma t twice, we get minus gamma squared cosine gamma t, and the fast term, that means this k cosine omega small t, we only differentiate it with respect to t. And now we get plus k omega small squared cosine omega small t and cosine gamma t. This is on one side, and on the other, we will get alpha with two dots if we substitute alpha from the second line into the equation written in the first line. And we will get such a product of two brackets and also cosine gamma. To, well, it is clear that cosine gamma t cancels out completely here because it is present in all terms. And now the most important thing. We need to highlight the fast terms on one side and the slow ones on the other in the product of two brackets. So the fast ones are where cosine omega t is. On one side, this is k omega squared. And now from the brackets, I get epsilon omega squared from the first bracket and one from the second. On the other side, from the first bracket, we have omega squared and two minus k, giving us such a relationship then we say that omega squared is much greater than omega squared. And since k omega squared is much less than k omega squared, we can cancel it out from here on omega squared and simplify. It turns out that k, this parameter of jitter, is approximately equal to epsilon. And epsilon, recall, is the ratio of the piston swing amplitude to the length of the pendulum, a small parameter. Now we need to deal with slow oscillations. And I will immediately change the signs for convenience in writing. With cosine gamma t, there is minus gamma squared, and I write gamma squared. Now I look at the product of the brackets. I wrote the product of omega squared and one with a minus, but a little further on. And there are also cosines omega t, with coefficients epsilon on omega squared and minus ke. Thank you. The square of the cosine, when averaged, gives one half. I will replace k with e. And here we obtain the relationship for the angular frequency of these slow oscillations. I would like to note that gamma squared here can be either greater than or less than zero. The second case leads to exponentially increasing instability. And the boundary between these two modes corresponds to gamma equal to zero. From this, I obtain the critical value epsilon star. It is the square root of two times omega large divided by omega small. Again, a small parameter. And if we substitute the parameters of the pendulum into this last relationship, we will get this formula, which differs from the estimate made by Alexi only by the presence of the square root of two. Therefore, the qualitative considerations from which he started were undoubtedly correct. And now we could move from this formula to the experiment, but first it should be noted that r, which is here, is the length of the mathematical pendulum. And our pendulum is made of a metal tube with a ball at the end. So its effective length should be substituted into this formula, which I will find now. I removed the pendulum from the setup, suspended it, swung it, and found the oscillation frequency to be 1.2 hertz. Therefore, the angular frequency 
which is 2p times greater, is 7.5 hertz, and the effective length, which is omega squared, turned out to be 17 centimeters. Here is this size against the background of the real pendulum. And now I know the critical frequency above which the shaft of the electric motor must rotate for the Kapitza pendulum in this setup to remain in a vertical position. It is equal to the square root of 2gr divided by 2pa, and r here is 17 centimeters, and a is the size of the crank, which is 90 millimeters. We substitute all this into the formula and find that the critical frequency is 15 hertz. And this can be tested in the experiment. Well, I will measure the motor's rotation frequency using a photogate. And at a frequency of 20 revolutions per second, the pendulum holds quite well. 19 revolutions per second. However, it tilted a little to the side. This apparently relates to the inaccuracy in the manufacturing of our setup. 18, 17 and a half, and the pendulum started to swing. This swinging occurred at a frequency of 16 and a half revolutions per second, which is close to our theoretical prediction of 15 revolutions per second. And as a result, we carried out a whole range of work. Observation of the phenomenon, its qualitative explanation, and quantitative assessments based on this qualitative explanation, computer modeling, development of mathematical theory, experiment, and comparison of this experiment with theoretical results. What else can be done here? And I have something to add. So far, Andre has considered a model without energy losses and then showed us a regular pendulum whose free oscillations were damped. Well, it is obvious that the inverted pendulum will also experience damping. Let's look at the computer simulation, adding resistance from the medium. And we see how the slow oscillations dampen, while the fast jerks, of course, remain. The same damping of slow oscillations occurs in the real experiment. We recorded it with a high-speed camera. Now the stroboscopic effect does not interfere, and we can observe the behavior of the pendulum in detail with fast and slow oscillations. Since a continuation has been found, Alexei, I also have something to add. But first I want to say that with videos like this, we definitely deserve your support. And how to provide it? It is written. Under this video is its description. But now I will ask this question. So far, we have considered the vertical movements of the piston. But what will happen if the piston vibrates not vertically, but horizontally. In this test, the Kapitza pendulum is held in a tilted position and does not drop down, and the details of its motion are clearly visible when filmed with a high-speed camera. And now for the final question. I will model such motion in the live physics program, and as before, I will switch to the piston's reference frame, adding a horizontal variable gravitational field, and we see that even with significant dissipation introduced here in the established final motion, the pendulum makes quite strong oscillatory movements up and down, unlike the vertical pendulum, which practically stopped. The question arises, why does this happen? Please share your thoughts on this in the comments of this video on YouTube. <laughs>